Nice. It's good to be here with you all. I have gotten a notice from PG&E that there are out power outages in my neighborhood, but it hasn't affected me. Hopefully it won't at all. But if I disappear, Mace is the backup. and <laughs> She will make sure that uh, the class, you know, continues in some shape, more peer-based form. Hopefully that won't be an issue, but I just wanted to say that now in case it does happen. And I also want to say how excited I am about the new space. I did get to go see it in person on Sunday for the first time, and it's so cool. It is a really great space. The old China bookstore and uh, in on 24th Street in the Mission, only a couple blocks away from the old site. Kind of a better location, more visibility than before, and a really good feeling in the in the space. So I look forward to hopefully seeing a lot of you there someday when it feels right for everyone. And uh, and so I just wanted to say that I, I am glad I finally stepped foot in the new space. So congratulations, SFDC and the board and everybody else who's volunteered to help make it a beautiful space and to find it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I... I wanted to kind of front load the meditation a little bit today, which is different than what we us what I usually do, and uh, read a couple passages from uh, from the section that we're in in our book uh, on the path to enlightenment, which is about the teacher and the te importance of a teacher and the importance of being a good student and all of blah 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 blah. <laughs> we know all that, but there's some good stuff in there. But also about the nature of mind and because we're going to meditate so i want to fret load a little bit so that we can we can take the mind as teacher there are a couple quotes from from the book that i thought were fabulous so i want to start with that one is on page 150 by shabkar for those of you who might be new we are working through this book called on the path to enlightenment it's a wonderful compilation of great teachings uh, from Tibetan masters over the years, over the centuries. And we are on page 150 right now. At the top, I'm just going to read the first, first paragraph, the first stanza, because it essentially says so much. This is by Shabkar, one of the greatest Tibetan yogis of all time, a poet, a wild nature <clears throat> yogi. He says, in the beginning I took the teacher as teacher. In the middle I took the scriptures as teacher. In the end I took my own mind as teacher. And then another quote that is similar but comes at it from a slightly different angle by Jamgun Kongtro Lodra on page 149. Externally, the teacher appears in human form and teaches the path to liberation. <clears throat> then comes a time when, through his instructions and his blessings, one comes to a realization identical to his or her. Then one sees that the inner or absolute teacher has always been present. It is simply the nature of one's own mind. So then the next chapter is on the nature of mind. And so what I'm going to do is I'll guide us through a, a meditation, about a 30-minute sit now. And once we drop in, you know, after some breath awareness, some mindfulness, grounding, and our bodhicitta, of course, then I'm going to read passages uh, by Dilgo Kyanse Rinpoche on how to do this, how to meditate on the mind as teacher, how to take the mind or the nature of mind, the kind of essential goodness or so-called Buddha nature as teacher in meditation practice. So we'll get to experience that now. So go ahead and, as Robert Thurman says, enter the meditative mode. <laughs> get comfortable. <clears throat> And that can be sitting upright in a chair or on a cushion. It can be uh, lying down in the supine position if that feels appropriate for you. The little trick to not fall asleep on this in the supine position is to lie on the ground with your forearm perpendicular to the ground. You can relax the fingers. I do this a lot because I have low back issues. So I've found that I can meditate on in the supine position 
if I just have that little wakefulness because of my arm. And then also, I meditate with my eyes open. But it's up to you. Upright, seated, standing meditation, walking meditation. But I would say maybe for this sit, uh, for this practice, um, walking meditation is more of a particular practice. So either in the supine, seated, or standing positions is good. So Turning inward and taking deep breaths, releasing tension with the out breath. Feel tension melting out of the face, the jaw, the scalp, the neck. With each out breath, feel that any physical tension melting down into the earth beneath you. Releasing the shoulders, the mid back, the solar plexus, the belly. <clears throat> the belt line. Just soften the whole belt line. Let the breath really enliven that area. Release any holding or tension there. Any tension in the low back, the hips, the legs, all the way down to the feet. Everything just melting down, down. the outset of our practice, we arouse the motivation for our practice to be of benefit in your life, in your community. It's called the single-pointed intention of bodhicitta. To awaken for the benefit of self and others. Also giving thanks, this earth that we tread upon, <clears throat> those who've come before, perhaps acknowledging the indigenous peoples who live in this land, who have lived for centuries, give thank you, thanks and gratitude. Now really giving yourself permission to nourish your own body-mind matrix now. We all need time to refuel, replenish, be inspired. This is 100% your time now. The eyes closed or open, whatever feels comfortable for you. We'll take some time in silence, practicing mindfulness of breathing implementing the tool of counting to help stabilize the attention at the top of the in-breath and internal count one at the next breath the apex of the in-breath internal count two and so on from one to 21 in silence now 
Releasing tension with the out-breath, just simply attending to the sensations of the flow of the breath in the body, releasing distraction, coming home to this present moment. Mindfulness of breathing. Now release the counting, release the focus on the breath per se, and allow the eyes to open if they're closed and gently gaze at a comfortable angle towards the floor and soften the gaze. Not staring at any one point, but rather feeling a quality of lantern consciousness, a full, a broader visual and mental awareness field opening. And feel as if you were gazing into the domain of the mind itself, that arena within which all thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories, fantasies and so on arise and pass. And 
like an observer, just take the, in a sense, a stance of ease, repose, not fixating on or overly identifying onto thoughts that arise and pass. Feel the quality of spaciousness and space between you and those arising and passing thoughts, feelings, sensations. They're not good, they're not bad, they don't need to be changed or cut off. They just arise and pass. And as meditators, we've observed, without a doubt, that this kind of mundane mind, the thinking, dualistic mind, unlike enlightened awareness, is always kind of being carried away by one delusion after another. Thoughts of anger, resentment, and so on, come and go reinforcing habitual patterns that keep us looped in samsara. So first acknowledging that, like the Buddha acknowledged that there is suffering, the first noble truth. And Dogo Kensei says, yet however strong these thoughts may seem, they are just thoughts and will eventually dissolve back into emptiness. And once you recognize the intrinsic nature of the mind, these thoughts that seem to appear and disappear all the time can no longer fool you. Just as clouds form, last for a while, and then dissolve back into the empty sky. So deluded thoughts arise, remain for a while, and then vanish in the voidness of mind. In reality, nothing at all has happened. He says, when sunlight falls on a crystal, lights of all colors of the rainbow appear, yet they have no substance that you can grasp. Likewise, all thoughts in their infinite variety, devotion, compassion, harmfulness, desire, are utterly without substance. There is no thought that is something other than voidness or emptiness. If you recognize the empty nature of thoughts, at the very moment they arise, they will dissolve. Attachment and hatred will never be able to disturb the mind. And deluded emotions will collapse by themselves no negative actions will be accumulated, so no suffering will follow. So ponder that. Ponder his words for a few minutes here in silence. Let that sink in and mature within you and your experience.
And Dilgo Gyanseva Rinpoche goes on, he says, the mind has, in general, two aspects, stillness and movement. Sometimes the mind is quiet and free from thoughts, like a calm pool. This is stillness. Eventually, thoughts are bound to arise in it, and this is movement. In truth, however, although in a sense there is a movement of thoughts within the stillness, there is actually no difference between these two states. Just as the nature of stillness is emptiness or voidness, the nature of movement is also emptiness. Stillness and movement are merely two names for the one mind. Most of the time we are unaware of our state of mind and pay no attention to whether the mind is still or moving. While you are meditating, a thought might arise in your mind. The idea of going shopping, for instance. If you are aware of the thought and just let it dissolve by itself, then that is the end of it. But if you remain unaware of what is happening and let that thought grow and develop, it will lead on to a second thought, the thought of having a break from your practice and no t- and in no time at all you will find yourself actually getting up and going out to the market soon many more thoughts and ideas will arise how you are going to buy this sell that and so forth by this point you will be a very long way away from your meditation It is completely natural that thoughts keep on arising. The point is not to try to stop them, which would be impossible anyway, but liberate them. And this is done by remaining in a state of simplicity, which lets thoughts arise and vanish again without stringing onto them any further thoughts. When you no longer perpetuate the movement of thoughts, they dissolve by themselves without leaving any trace. When you no longer spoil the state of stillness with mental fabrications, you can maintain the natural serenity of mind without any effort. Sometimes let your thoughts flow and watch the unchanging nature behind them. Sometimes abruptly cutting the flow of thoughts. Look at naked awareness. Practice like this. At times let your thoughts flow and watch the unchanging nature behind them and at times abruptly cut the flow of thoughts and look at naked awareness.
in the last few moments, let go of any effort and just let yourself be at ease. Dedicate the merit of our meditation for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you. Curious to hear anyone who wants to share from experience, especially how it felt to let your thoughts flow and watch the unchanging nature behind them, or what it was like to at times abruptly cut the flow of thoughts and look at naked awareness. Is that something that you actually were able to experience? You can chat ask questions there or unmute yourself or if there's something else you want to share that's fine too that's an icebreaker <laughs> it's my question but not required such a beautiful essential teachings by one of the greatest masters of the 20th century Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche spent at least 12 years in a cave practicing in the snow snowy caves of Tibet. It's a beautiful documentary about him called, I think it's called Wisdom Moon. You could look it up on YouTube. Dilgo Kyanse Rinpoche. Yes, go ahead, Lucy. I will chat this his name in so you can look it up. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for the yeah. meditation. When I felt like I was finally getting my thoughts to come and go like the clouds and observe them as opposed to just getting wrapped up in them, yeah. then it's like there's a blank space or I don't know if it's just like I'm not thinking or that's the naked awareness, but then at that point, I asked myself, like, can I see naked awareness? And then I'm already, quite, like, having a thought, making a question. So yeah. it's, like, hard to know when you're feeling it. Mm. Yeah, it takes, it takes a bit of practice of, like, looping through that a few times. Like, oh, yeah, if I you know, get too much ideation around that experience of emptiness or the space in between thought, then it can kind of rob us of that actual experience. Real common instruction is like the space, you know, you know the space between one thought and the next? Prolong it, and that's meditation, <laughs> you know. And it just, it takes some some time to n not fill the void, right? Fill the vacuum, but actually mm -hmm. to kind of sit back and be able to bask. The feeling that I have is that I'm basking in it or gestating in it. Um, uh, it's familiar, so then I can just release and I don't have to wonder anymore. But it can take some time to get there. And actually your question leads into 
the next passage that he talks about in terms of thoughts and how to work with those thoughts of past, present, and future. So I'll read a bit more, and I think that will help help clarify you. your question. Yeah, yeah. But it's good you're getting a glimpse. So that's a good, very good question based on experience. And so it's kind of keep chipping away at that. Yeah. I see... Uh, I saw uh, Bridget, and then then I'll go to you, Nick, okay? So I'll read her chat, and then we'll take uh, Nick live. So um, Bridget's question, when he spoke of mind, did he mean mind and the associated feeling that is rooted into the body? Or are we supposed to try and focus solely on only thought? Right. Um, by mind and the feeling, I mean the thought and the associated feeling or emotion attached to it. Yeah, all of that, all of the above. Yeah, when he's saying mind and thought, you can lump in their feelings as well. Associated bodily sensation and the emotional aspect. So psychosomatic feelings and psychological feelings, emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nick. I think yeah, that was really nice. Um, my question is uh, the Tibetan, they talk about um, what we did is this, like uh, pointing out instructions. Yeah, yeah. I would, it, yes, in a way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I just gave you pointing out instructions, but in a way I read his pointing out instructions oh, oh, to you. Yeah. So For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, right, that's what you meant. For yeah. sure, because I found that the, uh, the, the reminder to, um, experience the thoughts as being empty really helpful make them dissolve I, yeah. I thought that was really nice because something the emptiness is like uh what they call non-self and impermanent and satisfactory kind of has those things in yes like that you can kind of go Way. So I could see the thoughts arising and passing away. So they were really good pointing out instructions that he gave a kind of commentary. It kind of puts your mind in the right frame as, you know, not not as a meditation of telling you what to do, just to kind of point you what to look out for. It was really nice. And I thought it was nice. Yeah. Yes, good, good. This is the classic style of the Dzogchen and Mahamudra, these wonderful contemplative traditions that really are the oral lineage, you know. The, it's like the, the, it's alive through experience. And so these beautiful poetic pointing out instructions can really drop us in like you experienced, Nick. And that's why I thought it would be wonderful to get drop, help you drop in and then drop the poetry into your experience so you could really a lot of these types of things are actually meant for that like to read read one paragraph or a stanza and then close your eyes or gaze into the sky and ponder it and let it sink in um, not just to be read and then a little while later go over there and try to recall all of it in a quiet you know corner somewhere else but actually have the book right in front of you read a paragraph you could get the if you don't have the book already get it and you know read these beautiful pithy we're in this really rich chapter now this is what made me fall in love with this book that's why I skipped over the teacher chapter because I'm like I want to talk about this <laughs> I want to talk about nature of mind Eve will talk about it too next time as well I don't we'll do it We'll do a little bit of the teacher too, but yeah, this this is such a beautiful chapter. Read it, contemplate it. Read it, contemplate it. Make it your own. Let it. It's like, what is it like? Um, dye in 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 the. Let your wool soak in the dye of the teachings, or however you want to say that. Kind of a, it rouses a little bit of energy to have a mm. um, a little bit of gentle effort. It's not completely effortless meditation. It's a little effort to contemplate yeah. what the instructions are. Yes, which is really good in the beginning, or and the middle and the end at times. But you know, especially uh, as we're learning, you know, as we're becoming more mature practitioners, this is really meant to lay the foundation for you, so you gain certainty in your experience. So, really great points, Nick. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay, uh, Roseanne, I felt really into my head and rather not very aware of my body. It was okay, though. It was interesting to focus so much on watching for thoughts to arise. Uh huh. Yeah, I know the wording is very mental, right? It's very like head focused, watch thoughts, space of the mind. But like the question that Bridget, Bridget brought up is it, can it also be all a phenomenal experience? Yes, it can be. Because, you know, everything's filtered through the mind. So they say that the, there are six senses in Buddhist psychology there's the five senses of sight, smell, taste. Uh, auditory hearing and touch those are five and then the mind is the six because all of those experiences filter through your awareness through filter through the mind so when they talk about observe the mind in dharma and in contemplative practices it doesn't exclude the other things now there are the four foundations of mindfulness where you kind of in a sense, that's a practice that creates arbitrary divisions so that you can focus on certain, kind of hone in your attention. But really, as long as we're in a body uh, with a functioning consciousness and brain, we are filtering all of our feelings, emotions, other sensory input through the mind. So you could be observing the mind and observe the perception of smell, right? You're observing the mind and you're observing that you're hearing sound because all of those experiences are filtering through the consciousness of the mind, the, the sixth sense. But yeah, perhaps it, perhaps the wording could be more inclusive um, or preliminary teachings could highlight that so that when you drop into the meditation, you you understand. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Brilliant moon, right. Brilliant Moon, Glimpses of Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche, and she posted a link to the YouTube there. Thank you. Great. Denise said, I too had ideation, an image of walking naked into the river of my mind, cutting through my thoughts. It was somehow helpful even so. Yeah. I look forward to going back and practicing with this, e this evening. Good. Good. Yeah, sometimes the imagery points us, brings us to an experience or helps us remember a feeling. So that's what's so cool about this approach is the mind's not the enemy here. Thoughts are not the enemy. You know, we just see them, they come and they go. Um, I want to... So the book we're studying now, Geneva, is the same one. It's the um, On the Path to Enlightenment. And Claudia, I want to answer this, and then I'm going to read a little bit more from the passage that I was reading from during the meditation, because he talks about some of the things that are coming up. Um, yeah, M Claudia says, I really like the metaphor of the mind, the empty mind thoughts, and a pool. I'm a swimmer, and I've noticed the stillness and the depth of the pool and the movement on the surface, the thoughts. This really resonates with me. That's so great. Yeah, stillness and movement, both equally empty. That's great. Thanks, Claudia. Okay, so he went. He goes on to say, um, innumerable thoughts and memories stirred up. This is page one sixty two of On the Path to Enlightenment. Dilko Kense Rinpoche is pointing out instructions. So he says, so you can still kind of rest in a meditative mode, you know as I read to you now. Innumerable thoughts and memories stirred up by the ten tendencies to which we have become habituated arise in the mind. One after the other, each thought seems to vanish into the past, only to be replaced as the next, in its turn, becomes fleetingly present to the mind before itself giving way to future thoughts. Each thought tends to pick up the momentum of the one before it, so that the influence of a string of thoughts grows as time passes. Ain't that the truth, huh? Um, and so this is called the chain of delusion. <laughs> this big chain is what we bring to meditation practice. Some of us have been doing this our whole life, and then we try to go on a meditation retreat, and we're <laughs> we've got a, a heavy load that we're carrying and need to cut through or release through meditation. 
He says, just as what we call a rosary is in fact a string of single beads, so also what we usually call the mind is really a succession of momentary thoughts. A trickle of thoughts makes the stream of consciousness. The mind stream. And the mind stream leads on to the ocean of existence. There you go, Claudia, for your water metaphor, too. <laughs> so the mind stream leads on or empties into or leads to the ocean of existence. Samsara. Our belief that the mind is a real entity is a conclusion based on insufficient investigation. I think that could just be a headline right there. We believe a river we see today to be the same river we saw yesterday. But in reality, a river never stays the same, even for a second. The water that made up yesterday's river will surely be part of the ocean by now. The same is true for the countless thoughts that run through our mind from morning to evening. Our mind stream is just a su succession of instantaneous thoughts. There is no separate entity that you can point out as being the mind. We're going to go deeper down this rabbit hole, so stay with me. He says, now, if we analyze the thought process carefully, it becomes evident that past thoughts are already dead, like a corpse. Future thoughts have not yet been born, as for present thoughts, they cannot be said to have any properties such as location, color, or shape. They leave no traces, and indeed they are nowhere to be found. In fact, there could be no possible point of contact between past, present, and future thoughts. If there were any real continuity between, for instance, a past thought and a present thought, that would necessarily mean either that the past thought is present or that the present thought is past. If the past really could extend to the present in this way, it would also follow that the future must already be present. But nevertheless, ignorant of the true nature of thoughts, we maintain the habit of seeing them as being continuously linked one after another. This is the root of delusion, and this is what allows us to be more and more dominated by our thoughts and emotions until total confusion reigns. It is of vital importance to be aware of the arising of thoughts and to still the waves of thoughts that assail you. Anger, for instance, is an extremely destructive tendency which spoils all the good qualities you may otherwise have. No one enjoys the company of an angry person. There is nothing inherently very frightening about the appearance of snakes, but because they are generally very aggressive, the mere sight of them inspires fear and loathing. Whether in a human or a snake, such a preponderance of anger is nothing more than the outcome of an unchecked accumulation of negative thoughts. If at the very moment an angry thought arises, you recognize it for what it is and understand how negative it is, your anger will calm down of its own accord and you will always be able to stay on good terms with everyone. On the other hand, if you let that first angry thought give rise to a second angry thought, in no time at all, your anger will be completely out of control and you will be ready even to risk your life to destroy your adversary. Have you been close to destroying your adversary? <laughs> I think, you know, we see that, we see anger really leading people to do things that don't make any sense. So if we can cut, you know, if we can see that, I love the metaphor of the mind stream, 
right? Like a river. We think it's a thing, just like we call a river a name, like the the Yamuna River in India or, you know, the Mississippi River. It's a thing. But really that's just a label pointing at a moving, ever-changing, impermanent, empty phenomenon. There's no river there, really. Just like there's no mind there's no mind here, even though we assume there is. Same with self, same with other. So back to that line that I liked so much. Is that uninvestigated? What was that? Really, the root of delusion stems from an uninvestigated uh, assumption of how we exist. That's what the Buddha taught. We suffer because we fundamentally misunderstand the way we exist, our mode of existence. And so that is liberation when we can, we can, it's like the matrix, right? We can kind of pan back and see the Indra's net. You know, the metaphor of Indra's net, the Hindu, the Vedic god Indra, the myth goes that he, was creating the universe and he created this net above Mount Meru, the center, you know, the axis mundi of the universe. And in every juncture of the net is a gem or a pearl, multifaceted, that reflects every other gem. So within it is everything else. And that is a metaphor for emptiness, for the interdependent, empty nature of all phenomenon. I've been writing about the Indra's net and for my 12th Tara chapter, so I've been thinking a lot about that. It's such a beautiful metaphor. It's also um, echoed in the, the common Buddhist symbol, the endless knot, that you also see in Celtic uh, art as well. That's the symbol for the 12th Tara, by the way. So that symbolizes inter, interconnect, interdependence. So when we have an authentic, really direct, personal experience of raw, unmediated, somatic, yes, body-centered, mind-centered, integrated-centered experience of interdependence, it is exactly what Dogo Kensei is talking about here. Mace, Pamela. I was just thinking when you're talking, I like the word, this word kind of simultaneous for that, for the idea of, uh, like you're saying, the river, it's not a river. But I like to think of it, it's not a river and it is a river. Like they, like it's simultaneously itself and not itself. Like I find, for me, I find that has been helpful because then it helps them. Um, is it nihilism or that way in which sometimes with like emptiness or things don't exist or like mm -hmm. I can get a little, um, yeah. it uh, generates a dissociative quality in my experience of practice or my experience of emptiness. And what I found was, um, holding things so openly like it's like it's described in this text but also not um annihilating them so that idea that they're simultaneously existing as themselves and as um uh ephemeral as, and ephemeral has been um very helpful I don't know. I just yeah. I, that's a great way to put it. I would say yes. Stamp of approval. That makes sense to me. <laughs> Not that you're looking for my approval, but I think that what you said makes sense from the Buddhist perspective of relative ultimate truth. You know, same two sides of the same coin. That's another way of saying also emptiness and interdependence. You know, when you look at reality from one angle, you can see the fullness, the interdependent web of like yes, it is. It does exist. And then from the other angle of emptiness, you see that it doesn't exist, but they are true simultaneously, which is interesting that you bring the notion of time up based on his 
kind of wild um, journey into past, present, and future thoughts. That that's also interesting because really none of those exist. And there's a saying called "rest in these style." He doesn't say this here, but there's another pointing out instruction that says. Rest in the fourth time beyond the three. And that is no time. Or maybe spontaneous time. But it's the three are past, present, and future. So we're not caught in those three. Past thoughts have are dead. They're gone. Future thoughts haven't yet arisen present thoughts can't be pinpointed because as soon as you try to pinpoint it they're off into the past (laughs) or you're hoping and moving into the future there's no way to really lock down or um, identify any of those as being truly existent so rest beyond that the fourth time beyond the three which in a way could be that spontaneous arising you know it's called lenki so that the pristine awareness, Rigpa, your own Buddha nature, is ever, f- it's like the rays of the sun. It's just, they're all, it's always shining. It's spontaneous. So I'm taking your spontaneous thing a little further here. <laughs> okay, Lindsay. Um, I just wanted to say after listening to what, am I echoing? I'm echoing to myself. It's not that bad to me. Okay. Um, just after what Pamela said about thinking about the, the river and the not river as existing simultaneously, uh-huh. um, I'm just noticing how strong my conditioning is just growing up, um, in a Christian worldview. And I mean, I was, I went to a Methodist church. It's pretty chill. It, it's not, it wasn't sort of like this is sinful and don't do this. That was not really the messaging, but nevertheless, when I think about um, letting thoughts go, I find that my mind wants to go to the place of like, thoughts are bad, eradicate them mm-hmm. and and like stop having them because they're wrong. Um, and it's just so fascinating to kind of see that deep conditioning come up. Yeah. And as I know, that's not what we're talking about, but I am um, sort of just thinking about the nature of the mind is to have thought. The nature of the mind is to, that the stream will flow, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, it's, I guess I'm just wondering, I feel like a little kid, I'm like, but why do we have thoughts then? Is that just, is that just samsara? That's just the hand we're dealt. That our mind is actually that's what it does and it doesn't mean the things that we assign it right right that that's a sign of 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 a, of a mature practitioner is that when thoughts aren't the pro- are a problem <laughs> you know um even the buddha had thoughts after he attained he even had pain even had mara appear to him like st- shit happened basically even after the buddha got enlightened but it was the way he related to it that had changed right he would didn't reify mara or himself or phenomena as real he could see this simultaneously existent and non-existent empty and fullness of all reality so another analogy from the dzogchen of the mind the nature of mind so we have the nature of mind which i want to clarify in terms of in terminology because it's important the words that we use especially in these subtle realms of consciousness and mind what are we talking about so in Dzogchen, nature of mind doesn't refer to the habitual thinking mind. The nature of mind is a is maybe a clunky translation of what's in Tibetan called semnyi. Semnyi, which means like mind itself, which is the intrinsic, like the kind of Buddha nature, you could say. So just in your minds, think, in your mind, think that nature of mind equals rigpa, which is pristine awareness equals Buddha nature, like synonyms. The natural state is another way of saying that. Versus our habitual state, which is the running on and on mind that's always thinking and that natural inclination. Yes, the mind runs on and on. 
Okay, so in Tibetan, the terms for these are different. So the running on and on mind is sem, S-E-M. And that's the dualistic mind, the ever-thinking mind, the thoughts, the thoughts. That's not the enemy, you know, those, we need our mind. The term for mind itself, semnyi, or nature of mind, is rigpa, which is, literally means to know, or it's, it's, it, it, but in Dzogchen, it's translated as awareness, or pristine awareness. I don't know if I like pristine, I don't know, but awareness with a capital A, you know, consciousness with a capital C, that, that la, you know, <laughs> God, consciousness, that experience of our Buddha nature. So you have Sem on the one hand and Rigpa on the other. And what they say is that Sem and Rigpa are like the sun and its rays. Okay, so Rigpa is the sun. Sem, dualistic mind, are the expressions of the sun, right? Expressions of the Rigpa. Thoughts. They're not separate, right? Just like the rays of the sun aren't separate from the sun necessarily. They emit from the sun. And yet they're not exactly the same as the sun. So likewise, thoughts are like natural expressions, effulgences. The term is rolpa, uh, ex natural expressions, um, emanations, you can say, or yeah, expressions of rigpa. And therefore, how could they ever be impure? How could they ever be a problem? That's the path of purification back to the essential goodness, is realizing, wow, okay, and that's pretty deep. Because then by extension, do we say that even hate is fine? Well, that's why Dzogchen in Tibet became outlawed by one of the kings in the early days, I think around the 9th century, 10th century. Long Dharma was right before Atisha came to Tibet to revive Buddhism, because Dzogchen people were misunderstanding Dzogchen and those teachings and saying, "Well, I can be an, a jerk, you know, I can go murder people or steal, and it doesn't matter because it's all emanating from the same sun, you know, it's all pure." But that was a misunderstanding of karma. It was a misunderstanding of uh, ethics and interdependence or in terms of cause and effect causality. And then you get uh, Padmasambhava's famous quote in response to that misunderstanding saying, while my view is as vast as the sky, meaning yes, everything is naturally perfect and pure already as it is, liberated as it is, my conduct is as fine as bar roasted barley flour. You know, in Tibet they roast barley and then they grind it in stone and they make this really fine, it's called tsampa, it's super fine flour. And they eat it with butter and hot water and so on, milk. So he says that his con while his view is as vast as the sky, very expansive and kind of ultimate reality stuff, his behavior, his respect for ethics and conduct and kindness and love is as fine, you know, he pays attention to his conduct as fine as finely as barley flour is. So we, we never, you know, it's important not to go too far with that. But um, why am I all the way out here? Oh, mind, sem, and rigpa, right? So mind itself is nature of mind. So you could say the habitual state of mind is to always think and ponder and ruminate and hope and fear, but the natural state of mind is actually clear like that limpid pool of water. Um, so, does that help, Lindsay? Did I go? Is yeah, that... no, that, that really helps. I really, um, I've never heard it explained that way before. And I think just breaking down those concepts, yeah, that, that was super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think as Westerners, we're just not, we don't grow up with this, and so we're not given benefit of the doubt by just let, let's designate, let's define some terms so we, we're actually all talking about the same thing. Because it's true, when I've taught settled your mind in its natural state, people will come up to me and say, 
my natural state <laughs> is really chaotic, you know, <laughs> distracted. And I'm like, okay, let's get clear. Natural state, in this context, we're talking about Buddha mind, you know. Habitual state is what you think is your natural state. <laughs> Which is to think and think and distract and hope and fear and judge and, you know, all of that. Clamp down and feel imprisoned or, you know, yo-yo. Well, and, just, and just the, again, I, I, I don't think it's just from growing up in, like, Christianity, but just the impulse to rid yourself of something. Right. So, so you then have from to get rid of the bad. Yeah, that's what this is so liberating. I I think I've spoken about this maybe in the last few classes or one of the last classes I taught here, which is this moment where I was on a retreat with Alan Wallace, who's my main mentor in this style of meditation of Dzogchen, Shamatha, the Pasana practice. And I, I, we were from one of our sessions, we were at least halfway into the retreat. It was kind of, you know, up and down, different experiences like retreats can be. In this particular session, we were all meditating and I was so tired. I was, you know, I don't know if you've been on retreat where you are nodding off in a session. It's so tired, just like in class in the past, perhaps you just can't even keep your eyes open. And I was struggling and I was fighting it. And he gives this instruction, rest in awareness, free of preference for the good and, you know, pushing away bad experiences. Thoughts aren't a problem. Fatigue's not a problem. Welcome it all in that expanse, in the space of your awareness, the space of the mind. And watch it. Just observe it. You don't, you're not wanting one experience over another. You're just observing all of it. Bliss, pain, whatever, everything in between. And I got it. I got it. And, and I swear to God, the fatigue evaporated. It really did. And I think for me personally, it's because my struggle with it, my judgment against it, and my struggle with it eased. And I could just be. Um, so it's like those experiences where we you you taste it for yourself and then you know it to be true. That I've never forgotten that. That was twenty five years ago, and I can feel it even right now. So the thoughts aren't the problem. The feelings, even the anger, you know, even the pain. It's hard to really get that one for me personally, you know. But you know. Can the pain be held within a, a larger space of awareness? Yes, it can. Just like thoughts of anger and desire and fatigue and everything else. And in fact, Lindsay, thoughts are the natural effulgence of your pristine awareness, your rigpa. So how could they be a problem? It's like hating your own children. <laughs> you know? <laughs> hating your own arm. You know, it's an extension of you. Or not hating. I'm not saying you hate, but I'm just saying judging, wanting them to go away. Okay, I saw. I wanna. I saw something with um, Walt. Uh, good question, Walt. But I want to volley this back to you and you what you think. Is there a difference between anger and so-called righteous indignation? Do you want to talk or you can chat in? You don't have to if you don't want to. I mean, you are asking oh, no, me. I, but I'd like to hear from you. Um, short answer, yes. I think there is a difference. Um, I keep echoing here and I don't like it. Um, but what I, was, what I was going to say is that righteous indignation uh, being upset, um, I don't know, something simple, uh, seeing an adult beat up on, on a child or something, you know, and that righteous indignation can be an immediate motivation to act, to do something about, to react to that situation, hopefully in a positive way. And if our objective is to not 
be upset, to not be angry, I think it would be very easy to say, um, or actually to even mask our fear. Oh boy, that's a bad person over there to turn away from the situation and uh, simply say, oh gee, I have compassion for that poor child who is suffering, but you know, I'm not going to react. I'm not going to be upset or angry about that thing which is happening. And of course, I, I think it can be also applied to to broader situations of uh, social injustice, um, mm -hmm. as well as individual situations that we might run into every day. So that's my take. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I think that we can't let our spiritual practice, no matter what it is, make us numb. Uh, passive when we need to be active. I would say that hopefully that our practice is making us very responsive, you know, that we can in the moment respond in an effective, skillful means way, skillful way. So I think that's, yeah, very true. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to say or ask anything? Paul? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want you to say a little bit more about the, the mind and body connection. That the mind is anywhere in the body or everywhere in the body. Because, you know, in my many years of massage experience many times touching a specific spot on the body triggers the mind yeah. for either a, an emotion or a memory of in a positive way sometimes and other times in a not so positive way yeah but that that's like a, a two-way street that the mind can control the body but the body can also have that connection back to the mind Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I would say that in the Dharma, from the Dharma lens, the yogic lens, too, that that is very true. And, you know, they say that your issues are in your tissues, <laughs> the mind and uh, memories and, you know, trauma. And I mean, even smells, things. you know, you, you touch a body part and you can have a smell come back to you at times. It's just an, an amazing, you know confluence of everything yeah 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 absolutely the, the the separation of them is an illusion you know it's kind of based on scientific assumptions kind of early medicine and science that that's all breaking down i remember a long time ago this was a long time ago in college reading a book a wholeness in the implicate order by uh the scientist bomb uh, Bohm, B-O-H-M, I think is how you spell it, the quantum physicist. And he talked about a, I remember this very, very well, this part of the book where he talked about a study that was trying to find where memory lived in the body by using the sad, but using rats or mice, uh, putting them in a maze where a piece of cheese or food was on one end at the, at the end of the maze and they learned how to go through the maze to get the food and then they gave them plenty of opportunities to learn that really well and then piece by piece they started taking out parts of the brain because they were assuming well obviously memory is living in the brain we just have to find where it is so we need to through a process of reduction take out pieces of the brain so that when each time we put the mouse back in the maze, if they can't remember, then we know that last piece was where memory is stored. But apparently they took out every possible piece of the brain that they could without killing it. And the mouse could still, the mice could still find their way through the maze. And what they deduced was that the, the mind is everywhere in the body. That memory and awareness is spread out throughout the body and not just found in the brain. 
This is like the holographic universe. So um, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I've definitely had that experience myself. Whether it's in yoga or receiving a medita- a massage, you know, release, crying, memories. I've had you know things released that are beyond my mental comprehension of them. Memories come and emotions releasing and. I think that those are there's space for that experience definitely within contemplative practices like Buddhism, and it's accepted as a part of the path. You know that those experiences are inevitable as we peel away the the onion layers of our consciousness and we um, kind of become more and more to our essential being. You know, free of the the more denser veils of conditioning and patterns that we've adopted. Those patterns aren't bad necessarily, but um, you know, it's a process of befriending and integration. That's actually another understanding of yoga practice is to yoke, is to integrate, is to unify, is to integrate these different aspects or dimensions of our being so that we, uh, you know, experience our wholeness, not separateness. Good questions tonight, everyone. I just want to, I, I would be remiss if I don't talk a little bit about the teacher. <laughs> and I thought there's just a couple great, there's a lot in there. Read it yourself. It's interesting. You know, it's very much couched in kind of more the monastic model of Buddhism and Tibetan ideas of devotion and guru yoga, which is kind of, which is beautiful, but it's also maybe can feel a little foreign, so you can read that with a grain of salt, but I think there's a lot of goodness in there. Um, in terms of... just want to make sure, I'm, I want to read it. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's just, I want to, I want... I want to read this to you because it's important for you because you're all, you know, practitioners and students of Dharma and it's important to be able to decipher, to discern a high quality teacher, somebody who's worth your time. You know, your time is important and you don't want to waste your time. Uh, Hopefully you feel like you don't waste it with even I, I think you keep coming back. It's great to feel that. Um, And being able to discern you know, I feel like I'm more of a spiritual friend, you know, I'm not trying to be a guru. Or, and a lot of these teachings are about finding a guru, which is a higher bar, and there's more at stake <laughs> when you commit to a guru relationship, guru-disciple relationship. Now, the other layer is the spiritual friend, the Kalyanamitra, that's a little less high stakes. And uh, I feel like, for me as a teacher, that's a position I feel more comfortable holding. <laughs> you know, your spiritual friend. So he says, this is um, Kangya Rinpoche on page 146. He says at the top, the teacher's knowledge should be greater than that of the disciple. If this is not the case, and if people who are supposed to be teachers are lacking in bodhicitta, so teachers need to have compassion, bodhicitta, right? If they don't, walk away. Go some find another teacher. Um, if if people who are supposed to be teachers are lacking in bodhicitta, it is a great mistake to follow them, attracted perhaps by their fame or personal charisma. Instead, it is evident that the blind cannot be led by those who are themselves blind guides. Therefore, to place one's trust in someone whose eye of wisdom is closed is a serious error in both the immediate and the ultimate term. This is not the passage. Yeah, he talks about how how challenging it is to really find a great teacher in this decadent age, he says, in this kind of, they call it the Kali Yuga, (laughs) this decadent age, um, the machine age. Uh, It can be hard to really find an authentic teacher who's walking the talk, who has the qualities 
of a Buddha or a liberated being. I mean, if we've had those teachers, we are very fortunate. Here it is. It is thus that, brilliant, this is page 144 at the bottom, bottom paragraph. It is thus that brilliant flowers will bloom. The four ways in which masters attract disciples who are fortunate in treading the path of liberation. The latter are like bees that come and savor the quintessential nectar of instruction. So these four ways are of the teacher. You know, this is the way a teacher really f is like honey for the bees of students or who really benefits beings. The first way is having generosity that is completely free from attachment. So the teacher should be generous, not greedy, self-centered. The second way is a way of teaching that is attuned to disciples' minds. So a teacher who can really you know, attune themselves to your questions, to your dispositions. The third way is the ability to introduce them to the practice that leads to freedom. That goes without saying. You know, can they transmit? Can they give pointing out instructions like Nick brought up? And for the fact that the teacher practices what he or she preaches, right? So we know that saying, practice what you preach. A friend of mine would say, teach, don't preach. <laughs> you know, when I was nervous about teaching Dharma, he's like, don't worry about it. Just teach, don't preach. <laughs> but practice what you preach. Practice what you teach. Well, everyone, we're one minute away from shy of nine, and I hope that you've found this to be fruitful for you, beneficial for you. Again, your time is precious. Don't waste it in things with people and teachers that you don't think are, you know, have those four qualities. And I will see you in two weeks. Eve will be here next week to continue into the, go probably deeper into this Nature of Mind chapter. I'll encourage her to do that. There are a lot more really cool passages. So we'll spend some time, because this is really the nitty-gritty, the, 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 the meat of the sandwich of this book. This is the most important aspect of the book, in my opinion, in terms of contemplative practice. So thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful night. Dedicate. Feel great. And we'll see you, God willing, in a couple weeks. Oh, Mani Padme Hung. Be well, all of you. So appreciate all of you. Thank you, Mace and Pam. All right. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chandra. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Feel Bye. free to unmute and say goodbye if you want. Yeah. Bye.